looks like we're all home people. So as far as those who have come in with us today, the Holy Spirit is a great teacher of the Word of God as well as uh, he's the teacher on the learning side and he is the guidance counselor on the living side. And both of them involve the Word of God. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins or mental attitude. You should pause and stop and reflect on it. Your conscience, the Holy Spirit as well, would convict, would identify it, and then your responsibility would be to confess it. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I give you a moment to do that. That's classroom etiquette. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. And I pray tonight, Father, that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. He is, the, he is one, of the, one of the titles given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ was Spirit of Truth. When the Spirit of Truth comes, uh, he will disclose, he will reveal, he will guide, he will teach, recall. Do all those things and that uh, spirit of truth the Holy Spirit of truth lives within our our body and is there to serve the Lord on behalf of our identity in Christ I pray tonight father the Holy Spirit would introduce us to the truth regarding the second study on groaning that Paul talks about the groaning within the body, the groaning within the body. And I pray tonight, Father, we would understand that, what it's there for, how we deal with it, and uh, what would be the resolution to it. How did we get it? Why? How do we deal with it? And what's the resolution to it? So we make that prayer tonight. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to each of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in Romans 8th chapter, looking at verses 23 through 25. <clears throat> he says, for we know, I'm reading from the New American Standard, for, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. That's verse 22. And that's important for verse 23, because look how to, verse 23 opens, which is our text. And not only this, and not only this, and what is not, and not only this, well, that's verse 22. We just read the whole creation groans suffering the travail uh, or the pain of childbirth together until now. And not only this, so that's attached to that, but also not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits, you know, we are individually dealing with this while the creation deals with it as a unit, right? The six days. But we ourselves having the first fruit of the spirit, first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves, notice how many times he's going to say ourselves. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And what's really interesting, and we'll see tonight, is adoption is at the beginning of the Christian life. In soteriology, you're adopted into the family of God as sons. And it's a key issue on the backside, right? Because we're talking about the resurrection here. And it's just kind of interesting that adoption if you thought that adoption was just on the front side and not on the back side, if there's not a front side, it won't be on the back side. But if there's a front side, it will be on the back side because you never lose your adoption. You never lose your status in your relationship with God the Father through Christ, which is a wonderful idea, isn't it? So that was verse 23. Verse 24, for in hope we've been saved, but hope that is 
seeing is not hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. And what is the it? The resurrection of the body. That's why, we're, that's why there's a groaning within the body. There's a groaning within the body. It's connected to, cre to creation, the whole creation, and not only this, but we also, right? There's a groaning out of the curse that the earth is under, our body is under. You understand that? And we, we know that, that that's the curse of Ad that's the curse associated with Adam's sin, agreed? In Genesis 3, 17 through 19. And Well, anyhow, that would be my study tonight, anyhow. Okay? So, let's say I had prayer. Wow. I'm off to the races then. All right. So, <clears throat> here's what's interesting, what Paul did. We always look for markers, don't we? We lo always look for markers as a student of the Word of God. You always look for mar markers. Well, in our great passage here is... Uh, Romans the eighth chapter and Romans the eighth chapter he uses this word groaning three times. And there's a good marker. In fact, my studies are are pushing that marker. I studied the whole creation in verse twenty in verse twenty two, the whole creation is is groaning, right? Look at verse twenty two. Right? It's groaning. Verse twenty three. It's the church age believer's body, right? Now, everybody's got bodies doing that, but here's the church age believer's body that has hope, which is confident expectation of the pro based on a promise of God. You understand that? And then verse 26, you're going to see it's the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's And, and of course, that'll be next week. We'll look at that subject matter. Now, last week, we looked at verse 22. Last week, we studied the groaning of the whole creation. No, that's, you know, remember he said all of creation uh, travails, uh, the travail of childbirth, the travail, the pain of travail, and that's based on the curse of Adam connected to the original sin. The original sin was committed out of Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree and the day you die and you will die. Well, off from that, there were curses announced upon the participants in it, both directly and indirectly. And those curses are identified. The one we're interested in is the ground and the body. That comes out of Genesis 3, 17 through 19, which we have studied. <laughs> and we're looking at that... Uh, in Romans 8, chapter 18 through 27, the three groanings, okay? This week, we're going to look at three aspects of groaning within the body of every believer because of the same travail of the curse. Now, Paul is dealing with how this affects the believer and how it's re resolved, right? We, we ourselves, he's talking to church-age believers. Now, all of humanity is under it, but there is a, a resolution given through Christ. Uh, and we'll talk about that. All mankind is under the travail growing within their bodies. How do I know it? Well, he says, look at, in that passage. Look at, just, just go there for a minute. Let's go, you know it, but let's go to Genesis third chapter. Let's look at verse 19. Because just like all humanity is under uh, Adam's original sin. Verse 19, let's see, verse 19. Uh, from 17 to 19, he's talking to Adam. And then in verse 17, cursed is the ground. And now he's in the subject, cursed is ground. Or the earth. In verse 19, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken... For dust you are, and dust you shall return. See how it's connected? Our body's connected 
to the curse of the ground, right? So that's very important that you that you you understand that. All mankind, all of mankind is under that. Look on your paper there. See Genesis two seven. You know God formed man, formed his body out of the dust of the earth, didn't he? And so to the dust he returns, because of Adam sin and the curse connected to it. Uh, then in uh, the third chapter, verse nineteen, which I just read, right? Uh, that uh, the earth is the body. Listen, watch watch the ground in Genesis two seven. Uh, the body comes from the earth. In Genesis three seventeen through nineteen, in nineteen it says that you will you will you will you will be fed off from it. You will live on it. And you will die on it, and then you will be buried in it. Because from dust you came, dust you return. Agreed? That's the earth to the believer. Well, that's the earth to humanity, but to the believer, you see? And in real life, we know that, don't we? I mean, who doesn't know those three things? They just don't know it's in the Bible properly. Uh, <clears throat> my grandfather, who was a farmer, used to tell me that all the time. Always buy real estate. Always buy real estate because we came from it, we live on it, we're fed from it, and then we die and go back to it. And he said, so, earth is the most valuable commodity you could ever invest in. It just depends on what kind of land you want to invest in. But you should invest in land. Um, but anyhow, that, that's just my grandfather. Um, and in our text, it says, and not only this, what's a reference back to actually 19 and 22. I just read verse 22. But also we ourselves, and the word ourselves becomes another marker internally, we being the church age believers, ourselves meaning we're all having this, we're all going to have the same experience. Our bodies came from the earth, we are fed from it, we live on it, and we die, and we're put back in it. We're re recycled, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, uh, but also, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, having the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, what, what do you suppose he, he means by the first fruits of the Spirit? Well, you know, we always put this on the board, this what do I symbols Christ dies on the cross for our sins he's buried he is raised from the dead the third day that's the gospel that's the gospel he died Christ didn't die for his sins he who knew no sin second Corinthians 5 21 he who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in him first Corinthians 15 3 and 4 lays out the gospel he dies for our sins according to the scripture he's buried and raised from the dead according to the scriptures and Romans 1 16 says the person who believes that, Romans 1.16, the person who believes that gospel is saved by the power of God, not the power of self, power of God. The, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. Ephesians, the second chapter 8 9 says, we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourself as a gift of God, not of works, least any man boast. And so, I mean, this is what we're, the first fruits, we are born again, the first fruits. He talks about here in this passage, he talks about the first fruits of the spirit. It's not just the first fruit, it's the first fruits of the spirit. We we ourselves having having that's echo present active participle, by the way. Echo present active participle, by the way. The first fruits being born again. If you're born again, your life has a different ending. Everybody comes from the earth, fed on it, lives on it, and dies in it, back into it. For the Christian who is born again of the Spirit, who is born again of the Spirit, your regeneration comes. The eight works of the Holy Spirit is what he's talking about here as far as a doctrine, the first fruit of the Spirit. There is a, a, a life of beginning and the person who has been born again will have a different result 
at the end of his journey on earth. You understand that? There will be the redemption. It's called the redemption of the body. If what we're talking about the first fruit of the spirit, we're talking the redemption of the soul at the, in salvation. In soteriology, it's the redemption of the soul. In eschatology, it's the redemption of the body. This is where it begins. This is how it closes down. Let me show it to you. I want you to, go to put your eyes on Galatians 2. Let's go to Galatians 2. When does a person receive the Holy Spirit? Right? Point of salvation. But, you know, what passage could we find? There would be many, but here is one. The foolish Galatians in verse 1. He says to the foolish Galatians in verse 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the, the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, that's what it boils down to, doesn't it? No? The answer is the hearing of faith. The hearing of faith. And, and we understand what he means by that. Now, we, he's talking about salvation. Now, watch this. Are you so foolish, which he's setting it in verse 1, right? In 3.1, that's what he said in 3.1. He comes back to it. He's made a statement. Now he comes back to it to, to push a doctrine again. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, talked about the Holy Spirit, see, you're regenerated, you're indwelt, you know the eight works of the Holy Spirit. Are you, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by, the, are you now be that's a question. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Of course not, foolish Galatians. Say foolish Galatians. Did you suffer so many things in vain if, the, if indeed they were in vain? Does he then who provides you with the spirit, that's grace, and works miracles among you, do it by works of the law or by the hearing with faith, right? Our life begins with the Holy Spirit. It is lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to be the end result. John 14, 16, does the Spirit ever leave you once he enters? The answer is no. He sees you all the way through the end into the eternity, right? I mean, for, he said, no, he will never leave you forever. That's John 14, 16. So, it, it's it's very important that we have it. Having begun by the Holy Spirit, are you trying to become, uh, are you now trying to be spiritual by works? See, there, there are so many people that do. They get saved by grace and then live by works. And they think that's spiritual. It's not. It's carnal. If you're going to live spiritual, you got to have the word spirit in it. <laughs> well, anyhow. Yeah. Now he says, then he comes on because this is how this is the first fruit of the Christian life. It's not it's just the first. That's where it begins. That's not where it doesn't begin and end there. It just begins there. Then he goes on and he says, even we ourselves groan. Sternazo, present active indicative. That's a main verb. That's a main verb. You know, I want you to circle that. Just circle it on your paper. That's a main verb. Now, I've already told you that you had one present active participle, right? It was the word having. You didn't, you didn't think it was important. You didn't think it was important, but all of a sudden, it is. It's a present active participle. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, present active indicative, waiting eagerly, present middle participle. Waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And that's a powerful verse. Now, here's the dynamics in the Greek language. Here's a dynamics. What's your main verb? That's important now. What's your main verb? Groan. 
grown, right? I, didn't I tell you circle it? <laughs> now, that present active participle, having, and that present middle participle, eagerly waiting, are connected to the main verb. Here's your main verb. Grown. He's got one, pre and it's a present active indicative. And he's got a present active participle up here, having what? First having first fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's salvation business. And then he puts another present act, well, middle, because it's a deponent verb, Don. It's a present middle, a deponent verb, which is a historical look at something. He puts that on. I, this is at the beginning, and this is the end, right? Not in the sense of life, right? Wait, waiting. Listen, having, this is waiting eagerly. See, when you got the ing on it, it's a clue. It's a participle. That's a clue. It's just like the English. It's a clue. So, see, so, so what have you got in between the salvation, something that's been going on since physical birth, right? The groaning, because the body's connected to the earth, and the earth is groaning, we're groaning with it, or it's groaning with us. Except I got saved in here, therefore I'm going to have a different end. I'm waiting eagerly for the redemption of our body. You know why? Because I've been saved. Hello? And the spirit that saved me here is the spirit that's going to raise me here. Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 9 through 11, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in my body is going to carry me through to the end. Oh, all right, let's go to Romans. Let's back up to Romans 8. We're in, you know, that's our, that's our chapter, isn't it? Romans 8, see our same chapter. So he's been talking about this. Romans 8 chapter. Uh, we're looking at verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh. He just, uh, just described that uh, prior to that, a description of that prior to You are not in the flesh, carnal, but in the spirit, spiritual. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, and he does, but if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to him. If he does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you through the through the though the body, though the let's say let me catch this back though the though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. He's talking about the human spirit. If but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who indwells you. And so when the Spirit comes in, he gives you Zoe life. This is Zoe. This is Zoe. This is Zoe life. That's the, that's the very life of God himself. That's why it's called eternal life. Zoe is used with eternal life. That's the Zoe life. And that life that began here in salvation continues forever. It's called eternal. You know, and how we got all that? Grace. Isn't it good? Oh, that's grace. You had the good, you had the good sense to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you got all that. Oh, that's free. Well, free to us, heavy penalty for Christ. Now, see the word eagerly waiting? Just showing you some dynamics here is really important. You see how important the main verb is to participles? Oh, yeah, good. Good. And it really helps you see something. It expands your, your, your view uh, doctrinally. See the word eagerly waiting? See, that was one of our participles, a present middle participle. I put that on your paper. But here's what you're missing. That's a, that's a, that's a three-compound word. It has apple. It has ek, and it has decomai. That's why it's a deponent verb, Don. 
<clears throat> I say that, Don, because we have this discussion often. There's the word. Now, the prepositions in the Greek language, when you study prepositions, it's difficult, unless, and so they diagram them so you can get an idea. They put a circle up there, and they run all the prepositions around that circle. It goes in it, like the word in, it means in, and uh, ek means out. And so you've got apo, and you've got ek. Ek, it means out from. And apple means away from. Those who have that, that primary, you remember that first year Greek book. You remember when we went through all those prepositions. The wonderful thing about that is that that's how they show that to you. They show you that E-E-N means you're in there. Ek means getting out of there. <laughs> House is on fire. <laughs> I'm getting out of there. Now, what is interesting, compounds intensifies the verb. In other words, whatever, whatever word is in there, in this case, decomai, this is important. These things here are magnifying it or driving it in some kind of direction. And they translated this word, uh, they translated uh, decomai as waiting eagerly, waiting eagerly. Decomai means to receive. And so when you put all this together, it intensifies the idea. And the idea in the Greek language is now, now you are ready. You are ready and prepared to receive what has been offered you by promise. You're ready. Eager, that, and so the, in the English language, we translate that waiting eagerly. To receive, waiting eagerly to receive our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. You know how you get eagerly waiting? The word of God, right? Ready to receive what God has promised me. That's why Bible study is so important to your life. You're not going to get this because you drive past the church. <laughs> right and listen it may di be difficult for you to get it sitting at home with all your distractions at some point you got to take the word of God serious in your life you got to get out of this nod to God business and get in the real real deal yeah, I know this word adoption is an interesting word. This word adoption. It's made of weos. There are different words in the Greek language for sons. Weos is a very important word because it's, it's, a, it's a son that has heritage. It's an heir. It's a son that's an heir with inheritance. That's who he is. And then the second word in here is tithemi. And that means to be placed to be placed as a son. Adoption, you, you understand adoption, but this is a person that wasn't born there, has been placed into a family with inheritance rights. We were born, listen, King James Bible says we were bastards when, when we were born into this world, right? Yeah. He, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 8. In the King James. They cleaned it, cleaned it up for us. They called it illegitimate in the New American Standard. Right? Well, it depends on what side you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Legally, I suppose, the lawyers probably cleaned that up and said Ill illegitimate. That's the way we're all born. And when we're born again, we're no longer that. No longer. 
I, I remember Rick Hughes and I was up in Holland, Michigan. We were doing a, a evangelism up there. And we were we were working the beaches in the daytime. It's a, it's a very big resort area. We worked, the, we worked uh, the beaches in the daytime, evangelism, and held Bible study at a local church uh, in the evenings that was accessible to the beach, close to the beach. And uh, the pastor allowed us to do it because we put a lot of people in his church. So it was a good thing for all of us. And one night, preaching, gave an invitation, and I preached on this subject, this very subject. I preached on this very subject. That it doesn't matter what your baggage is. I mean, you, you could, everybody in the whole world could call you that. It could be true. And it could be true. And you've had to carry that stigma in your life with people who knew you, and so you always want to move out of the neighborhood. You want, to, you want to get away where people don't know you because you have the stigma placed on you, right? Remember, back in the old day, you remember, what was that book where they had the Scarlet Letter? Sc Scarlet Letter. Remember that? Everybody had to read that, right? Yeah. Yeah, everybody had to read it. But anyhow, uh, and so we had people come forward, and there was, there was one lady who was broke. She was broke. She was broken. You know when I say emotionally broken? She was mostly broken. When the invitation, she was already there before the invitation ever came. When the invitation came, she was broken and she couldn't hardly, we required him to come forward because we didn't want to counsel with him. Um, and she, she like couldn't get, I mean, she just was devastated. She couldn't like walk or anything. I mean, she was just, and so there was a couple of young women and she was probably in her 20s. There were a couple of young women that worked on our staff in the summer up there that went over to her and began to talk to her and just brought her down. And, you know, we always said, what, why have you come forward? And what is your, what, what is on your heart tonight? Yada, yada. And this was, this was the issue that as a young girl, this is a very religious area, this Holland, Michigan, Dutch reform just was, I mean, she was just, she was just out. She was pushed out of the community uh, of people that she grew up with, got, got pregnant in high school, and was a cook goose. And um, kind of a little, kind of bullheaded and stubborn. I'm not going to, I don't care. This is my place. I'm going to stay here. And, and she got saved. And when she, when that thing was laid out about, we're all illegitimate. Listen, we're all bastards. There's not a person in here. I don't care how you were raised. I didn't care anything about that. We were all that. Back then, the only, only translation I had was King James. We were all bastards. And, and, of course, the boys liked that idea. Hey, I think he just swore. Uh, this is going to be, listen, we're pretty loose here. And they didn't realize it was part of the Bible. I said, no, nah, it's in the Bible, guys. Quit. And, um, <laughs> but, I mean, she asked me, I bet you 10, 15, 20 times, is that possible? Because I'm that person. I'm that if everybody's that way, holy catfish. I said, well, everybody's that way, so holy catfish. <laughs> because that, everybody's that way. We're born to illegitimate. And listen, when you get born again, <clears throat> you are born, you are adopted into the royal, the royal family of God through Christ. <clears throat> and, don't let, and now you're an adopted royalty son of God. And don't let anybody else. Listen, your life has been changed magically in this one evening. By the grace of God, your life has dramatically been changed. And don't let anybody tell you ever that again. You, when next time somebody tells you that, you look them right in the eye and say, listen, I'm a child of God. I've been adopted by the family of God. And be sure you know where you can find that in the word of God. <clears throat> I mean, that's how powerful the word of God is. This is this word. You have been placed... And not, not just any child, but you have firstborn rights of inheritance. Everything that Jesus Christ has inheritance-wise, you become accessible with it. You, you are part of it. You know how you got it? Grace. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You can't lose it. <laughs> I love that. 
What a wonderful. And I tell you, she lit up. She lit up. She lit up. The truth of God, doesn't that do that for all of us? When you find the truth and you, your life is here and the truth comes in there and you see how grace works and you get a promise from God, it just, you, you stick it and it just changes your life. Just changes your life. Well, anyhow, um, um, I'll tell you another word in here. See the word redemption? Let me show you this word and then I'll get to my study. <laughs> Let's see, apple, apple lutras. That's a U, that's an L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. Let's make sure I got that. I got that right out. Um, yeah, T-R-O-S-I-S, that's a long O. So that's a compound word too. And you remember, apple means we're going to go away, right? We're going to move away from and this this means uh, that's free to be, fr be f to be freed. The S I S on the end of that's kind of important. It, there's an action going on within the structure of it, and it, it, it means to be set free, to be set free from. So it's like a boat. Here's a, a, that's hooked up to a dock. I, uh, you can tell I am not very good at this, but you know here you got a boat tied tied to a dock, right? <clears throat> Got a boat tied to a dock, and you want to go fishing in a lake. Now you could you could you could fish for minnows, just get in the boat and said I went you know, I'm on the lake and I'm in a boat, but it's attached to the, the the dock, and you could fish because I've done that with my grandkids. Right, we sat out there with a cane pole and caught those little fish, and and they'd squeal, and you couldn't have caught anything bigger, and that made them happier, right? I did that up at Lay Lake. A boat pulled up next to me. And this is a true story. Pulled up next to me and said, do you have a fishing's license? I said, no, I'm not fishing. <laughs> Listen to me. I had just taken a fish off a hook. I had a pole in there. Going to throw it back out uh -oh. for one of my granddaughters. Right? He said to me, listen, this was a comedian. He said to me, what's that in your hand? I said, well, it's a fishing pole uh, for my granddaughter. He said, well, what's on the end of that pole? I said, uh, bait. He said, well, up here, buddy, we call that fishing. <laughs> hey, listen, I was, in the fr I was in the back of the boat with a granddaughter fishing. Deanna was in the front boat fishing, and they were catching these fish like crazy. We'd take them off, throw them back, right? These little bitty things. I mean, a cat wouldn't eat it. A cat would have went, now that's not enough. And we both, we both got a $100 fine. And listen, we couldn't pay him. He said, no, I don't take money checks or credit cards. We had to go to court. We had we went home to Birmingham and had to come back to some little town, um, Clanton or something. I don't know, Clubiana. I don't remember wherever the county seat is. We <laughs> and we paid two hundred dollars to catch these minnows. Lay Lake. <laughs> don't go up there. They know what a fishing pole is. And if it's in the water, it's called fishing. <laughs> then I had to pay $100 for a comedian. That was too much. Uh, so this idea, if you want to go fishing, if you want to go <laughs> catch the big ones, have a fishing license. <laughs> and, and cut the boot, boat loose and go out and catch fish. And that's the idea. Uh, untie, push away from the dock. It's set free for you to fish in the lake. <laughs> That's the idea of all that foolishness. Point number one. <laughs> I can't believe I just did that point number one. Oh, Jesus. Uh, see, you should come to our study. It's a lot more funny. It's a lot more funny and more fun to be here than it is to, in your house with the kids hollering. <clears throat> Church-age believers 
have been saved by the gospel of grace salvation, as we have talked in the introduction, and as a result, have hope. Notice, notice in uh, the Romans 8 passage that after you leave verse 23, it's all about hope. Verse 24, 25, look at that again one more time. Put your eyes on it. He talks about the salvation part and on the front side as the, fr the first fruit of the spirit and on the back side, the redemption of our body, right? And there we are in between with the participles, right? The main verb in between the two participles of, so of soteriology and eschatology, right? So I have to throw that out because I make all this big, I make all this big money. So I have to show you that I, I'm worth every penny of it. Of verse 24, 25, it, look at the word hope. How many times do you think it's used? In verse 24, 25. How many times do you think? Well, you could have looked on your paper. <laughs> you know, it's an open book test, isn't it? <laughs> if you're like me, you couldn't count anyhow. So, you know, you'd have to have somebody count next to you. You'd forget. I got to three like, like Suzanne did and didn't look any further. How many, how many is there? Put your glasses on before I come over there. <laughs> I don't know. You should always count mine. Oh, yeah, there's mine. Oh, thank you. Well, I was good. I, th I was afraid I was going to have to call one of my little grandchildren and to count to five for me. For in, watch this. Is that a marker? Oh, yeah, it's a marker. Right? Yes, it is. For in hope, we've been saved. Remember, elpis means confident expectation based on the promise of God. When you find hope in the Bible, it's not like hope in the dictionary. Not in the English dictionary. We're not like in hope. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Oh, didn't get it. <laughs> I'm going to cry. I hope, I hope, I hope. I <laughs> hope, I hope, I hope. <laughs> That's not it. It's the confidence. It's the, it's the up. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I've got hope based on the word of God. It's confident, Elpis is confident expectation based on the promises of God. Listen, he's faithful whether anybody else in your life is or not. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, you know what that word is? Hupomone. Hupomone. You know what that word means? It means patient, patient endurance. And that word is associated with undeserved suffering. But, but if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. What is the hope? The hope is not that we are saved. I hope I'm saved. I hope I go to heaven. That's a done deal. No, our hope is in the future. And that is the promise of the resurrection, right? The redemption of the what? Body. Not this one, the one from heaven. The, the spiritual body, not the natural body, the supernatural body. I mean, boy, I mean, there are probably many of you don't, rem don't know David Wisnant. Our library is dedicated to this young man. But boy, you talk about a guy who loved this idea of the redemption of the body and it, he was going to get a new one. Yeah. Boy, he didn't like anybody who told him, you're you going to get the same body, Bubba. And he went, no, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. I'm getting a new body. And, and I, th I often thought about him and Jeannie Wilson, the two wonderful loving caring people of our church. Uh, both of them, I always think of them uh, when we talk about this. Five times the word hope, confident expectation based on the word of God is used in our passage. For in hope we have been saved, like Colossians 1.27, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what has already been seen? You know what he's talking about? Listen, here, here it is. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not, not sight. When you, and what is our hope built on? Faith. Faith is based on the word of God, the promise of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And where will hope come? Hope comes out of that faith structure in your life. That's where that comes. 
comes out of faith comes out of the word of God and hope comes out of faith. That, and listen, you can be assured that what God, you can be you can be fully assured that what God has promised you, He is able, He is able, willing, and will do what He's promised. Right? Romans four twenty one. I mean, you can be fully assured. Why are you not fully assured when the Bible says you can be fully assured? Right? Fully assured. Well, hope is based on faith, as I just mentioned. And sight is based on either rationalism or empiricism. Our hope is based on faith, not on sight. How well, listen, here's a question. How well do we deal with the corruption of the body? Because you see, this process in between our in between birth and death, our body is in corruption. It's in a state of corruption, the natural body, which means it's decaying. We call it aging because, you know, you can't sell anything. So your body's decaying. Put this on. It stinks. <laughs> and listen, you know it's decaying because if you ever go into a retirement home, oh, yeah. right, you got to have a gas mask. <laughs> No, I'm no, I listen, I know but that's listen, that's a natural part of aging, isn't it? Decay that's decaying. You're going we're all going there. But listen, my question is, listen, part of this corruption, the part of this the body, you live on it, you die it, you go back to it and all that stuff, right? Listen, how well do we deal with the corruption of our body? How well do you? How, how well do you deal with uh, the aging, the diseases, and the disabilities, all that come with the body? Hmm? And, and it's in a decaying state from the day it's born. It's going to wither and die like a flower, the writer says. In second, if you want to know, if you want a good passage for that, Second Corinthians four sixteen. And I, you know what I love about it is the the positive side. Now listen, decaying is a positive side because listen, we're going to get a new body, aren't we? Wow, da 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 da. And are we waiting eagerly? Let me tell you, I've known a lot of people. I just mentioned like David Wisenant. He he was waiting eagerly. If you knew David. When you talk about the second coming, he saw it completely different than maybe the average guy. And what a wonderful promise that was, that guy. And if you spent any time with him, he talked about it. I mean, you know, a guy like me, I'd get with him and, I, and I'd walk away and I'd just... I would just be overwhelmed how well he could accept all that. You know, he had to work his way through life to get there. And listen, he had to work through it when other people couldn't work through it and, and left him. Which was difficult for him. You know, one time old Dave was, was madly in love and was engaged to be married. Uh, going through seminary. And the parents talked to him on the phone, but never saw him. And they came to visit. And when they saw him, they put a kibosh to it. And just, it just knocked him. And, it, and the girl was, she, she loved him and was, wanted to marry him. And the parents would absolutely not. Do you understand what a load this would be in your life? And it, it took him a while to struggle back from that type of thing. But he found, it, found his call in life anyhow, didn't he? In spite of all that. The believer's hope is based on the promise of the truth of the word of God. That's what the writer is telling us in Romans, the eighth chapter, especially in verses 23 through 25. And how well we deal with that. How well we deal with that is important. Paul instructs the church age believer how to deal with travail growing within the body because of the curse of Adam. He says, wait eagerly. Eagerly waiting. That's interesting, isn't it? And I think, listen, you know who you see it in? It's people who go over 
you know, you're going up this hill, then you hit, you hit that light, and you go like, whoa, I'm getting older. Now you're on the backside of that. You know what you should be doing on the backside of that? Eagerly waiting. And that, do you not know that the root believers are? They're eagerly waiting. They're ready. Simmeral, when I would visit with her and she was out there, listen, she like, look, I'm going where y'all coming, and I'm ahead of you. There are not many things I've been ahead of in my life, but this is one of them, and I'm pretty excited about it. And I said, well, you know what we call that? And she said, what? And I said, we call that eagerly huh? waiting. Eagerly waiting. And listen, if, if you've been the privilege to be with spiritually mature people as they approach death, this is what you see in them. It's exactly what you see in them. When my mother died, she was a little bit leery because her son was telling her there's life after death. She would like another opinion. Is it, can I get a second opinion? I said, you sure can. And so she took a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion. <laughs> and listen, one of the people that came in to reassure her from the word, open the word of God and showed her in the word of God that her son was correct about this. Said to her. I've lost a child. Let me tell you something. If I can get through it, said to her, I've lost a child. And here's my child's name. When you get there, would you hug him and tell him I love him? Whew. My mother said, whoa, get me a pencil and paper, Ron. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was the, my, that was my whole life, whether I was three or 83. That was my life with my mother. Right, get me a pen and a pencil. Get that. Okay. She wrote it down. Said, explain that again. Wrote the name down. The request. Listen. People. Believe, that word got out. And people, believers that had lost loved ones, began to file into my house like you can't believe. And my mother had a legal pad, and she filled up the first page of the legal pad, and then she got frustrated because she couldn't remember everything because she knew she couldn't take the legal pad. And I'm going to tell you, I never seen anything like it in my life. The change that came into my mother's life in waiting eagerly to die was amazing to me the transition from that little ministry into her life was an amazing thing. People just kept coming in going like, and she said, well, don't give me a long thing now. And so they were one liners, but they filled up. Listen, people filled up a legal pad for my mother of people. And she was absolutely convinced. She was the happiest person. And she was all the time what are you doing, mother? I'm trying to memorize all this stuff because I know I can't take the legal pad from the obviously. It's just what God does is amazing stuff that you couldn't have. Who would have ever thought of that? Not in a million years, but God. Isn't that wonderful? It just, it fired her up for where she was going. And it was an amazing, it was an amazing thing. Every church age believer receives the indwelling Spirit at the moment of salvation. That's the importance of what Paul has said about the first fruit of the spirit. The Holy Spirit is an important key to the persevering with hope. Not only in your salvation is he important, but he's important to your life. And he's important at the end of it, right? Because he can never leave you. So he's part of the whole kit and caboodle. I have no idea what a kit and caboodle is, but I know somebody will find that out for me. I've heard that all my life, a kit and caboodle. Have you heard that? And we use it, don't we? I don't want to know now, but <laughs> I probably should know in case it's okay to say kit and caboodle. <laughs> Half the time I don't, re I don't know. It comes out and I go like, mm, I don't know what a kit and caboodle is, so maybe I should do that. Uh, having the first fruits, that, that's that deal. Now we have the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.16. You walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. 
that's that whole process. And, and there is groaning, not groaning within the spirit, but groaning within the body. The body itself is growing because it's, it's perishing, isn't it? You know, in the sense of corrupting. Okay. Uh, in the same way, the spirit also, I like what in verse 26, which we'll talk about next week. He says in the same way, which is going to be a key. That, that's a trailer hitch. In the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how we should pray as we should, but the spirit himself. That's the Holy Spirit alone. He don't need help on this. <laughs> the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for saints according to the will of God. Don't you love he He's a cleanup man, ain't he? Bringing things to the throne of grace. Yeah, boy. Uh, point three, and then I get out of here. Notice the, notice the use of the word adoption as sons for the second time in the book of Romans. This is really important. The first time, and I did it up here. Remember, the participle over here was salvation. You remember that? Well, in Romans, the eighth chapter, 14 through 17, is very important. That's the salvation side of that. And on the other participle over here, that's at, that's at Romans 8, uh, 23 through 25. Th this is soteriology, and this is eschatology over here. And Romans 8, 14 through 17 is a dynamite passage on, salva on adoption in the salvation program. Oh, I, I wrote that on your paper. I, I do so much for you people. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thank you. Okay. I wrote all that down for you. I know, yeah. He predestined us. Listen to Ephesians 5. Listen, this is a great idea. This eternity past. Adoption out of eternity past. The whole thing was planned in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intentions of his will. You know what predestined? Predestination takes you all the way back to eternity past to the Eternal Life Conference where the whole thing is set up. Now it's just rolling out. Well, there you go. That's enough for tonight. And the main subject tonight was about the body, wasn't it? And how, how there is hope attached to it once you get saved. The hope of the redemption of the body in eschatology. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. I mean, what a wonderful thing it is to be able to hold the hand of somebody who's dying. I can't tell you. Let me tell you something. I can't tell you how many times I've used this Romans 8, 23 through 25 in talking with people who are approaching death. Terminally ill people. That's my, that's my go-to passage. I use it a lot. It's one of my go-to's. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for your love, mercy, and grace. We're thankful for the salvation that comes by grace through faith and not of herself. It comes through the gift program of God. I'm so thankful for that. And I'm thankful that gift is extended to the Christian life on earth. And through the word of God and the hope that's developed by the faith system working in my life, I have the confident expectation of the promises made that you will walk me through life, through the valley of the shadow of death into the light and presence of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I'm telling you, Father, I believe that is about as much as I believe in anything I've ever believed in in my life. And how is that possible? Just like my mother, how is that possible? Oh, the things that God has for us in time are just a, a glimpse of what eternity will be like. And boy, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty wonderful. Father, I want to thank you that. I want to thank you for all the believers that have that waiting eagerly as they approach the door of death with joy and confidence peace 
because you have walked them to that door yourself. They have not walked there alone. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful, Father, to know that and be able to be there holding the hands of those who are walking to that door and through it. As we all are. Those who have great ministry in the truth of the word of God will set with these people. They will walk them out of this life and into the next. By the word of God and encouragement. Like people did with my mama. I'm so thankful for that. They did things I could have never imagined in a million years to do to excite her soul, to wait eagerly. You're a, a wonderful father. And I'm thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen.